Hey this is Sayyam Botani and you're listening to Chai Time Data Science a podcast for data science enthusiasts where i interview practitioners researchers and calculators about their journey experience and talk all things about data science Hello and welcome to another episode of the Chai Time Data Science Show. In this episode, I interview my friend from the Fast A family, Robert Brackoff. Actually, correction, it's it's not an interview; it's a conversation between the two of us, where essentially we discuss or interview each other about how we approach learning to learn. A theme I've recently picked up for the podcast, and of course, as you might imagine, we talk a lot about. the fast ai courses and how our approach to learning to learn has evolved as we have approached the materials robert has been working on the fast dot the fast ai audio module the unofficial audio module and i asked him about his journey in that direction how has his learnings evolved of course i have interviewed him about his journey in a, in the previous episode so please do check that out if you're interested This is the first episode where I have eleven cups of chai <laughs> in the during the conversation. So I hope it's as enjoyable for you as it was for me. For now, here's my conversation with Rob. Please enjoy the show. Hi everyone! Welcome to the first conversation or on the interview series, so to speak. So I hope you'll forgive me if if you don't want to hear me talking. But I am on the call with Robert Bracco. Robert, thank you so much for agreeing to this crazy idea. Oh yeah! Thanks for having me. I'm super excited. Uh, ever since I did the first podcast with you about audio, I've been dying to come back and just talk about all things fast AI, self education, learning. So really excited. likewise i i think we have a lot of and we've been chatting about it constantly back and forth so i think it's it's a good way to articulate all of these ideas so um i i want to start with what and this will be i think just for the audience reference this will be more of a conversation that have that'll have a lot of back and forth but uh, rob what made you start fast day what what made you decide to do that investment yeah i had just completed uh i was a bit lost and kind of wandering and i ended up deciding i need some structure but i'm not going to go back to school so i took three online courses at the same time and tried to pretend it was a formal college semester i sat down i was like i'm going to be there at 8 i'm going to work until 12 5 days a week and i did that and one of those courses was intro to machine learning andrang on coursera really famous machine learning course and i came out of it and i wasn't able to build anything I was really excited about machine learning. I felt like I understood <laughs> back propagation. I'd built a digit recognizer in Octave, and I came out and was like, "I'm, you know, really no closer to doing what I want to do." And somehow I just got super lucky. Fast AI came across, I think, my Twitter, and I read the intro from Jeremy saying, "Like top down, we're focused on building," and I was like, "This is the thing." So I just went all into it, and that was about a year ago. Okay, how about um, yourself? for me actually it was it was very funny and uh, before that i also want to talk about the andrew and course i think and it's from the interview series one of the guests actually mentioned like if you want to learn from someone who's really famous and maybe not the best useful techniques out of it that's the course to go for i, I feel like i really echoed with that point there even though like it's it's great in ter- terms of theory i think the course is slightly dated even though like the theory is good you could you could learn a lot there but it might not be the best starting point i feel Yeah, and to be fair for everyone who doesn't know, the course came out in 2014. So, you know, it's a bit dated and I know Andrew Ang, I haven't uh seen too much of his newer content, but I know he's working just like Jeremy to put out lots of great content accessible free. Yeah. Uh But so. again, I I think it's it's not not the first course that I would recommend now. Of course, it's fast AI by default, but if I had to recommend even Intro to ML, maybe after you know a few things of how to apply the ideas. 
Yeah, I think so. I think it's really important. I think one thing that gets lost in academic courses a lot of the time is that they use whatever technology they feel like, and it's not necessarily the technology that's being used by 95% of uh, industry. So, yeah. you know, in fast AI, you're using Python, PyTorch, uh, a lot of the tools that you're going to be using after you leave fast AI. And I feel that if you take a university course, sometimes they'll just say, Hey guys, we use octave, get used <laughs> to it. And you're just stuck. So uh, it's kind of one of the unfortunate things about some of the uh, university courses. To, to put it out there very bluntly, the professors, mo most of them who teach these courses have never been a machine learning engineer, have never been a data scientist. So they might not be able to teach you the best practices out there, even in terms of the toolings. The theory might might be correct, but again, it, it wouldn't involve the industry best practices at all. Yeah, very possible. And that's something I felt was a major. So for to give a little background on myself, um, I graduated with a CS degree, computer science degree about 10 years ago. And I came out into the industry and felt like I had, you know, pretty much no clue. I couldn't code well. I didn't feel solid in any language. Of course, I'd learned like the overall theory of programming languages. If I needed to work on a compiler or something, yeah, I could do some things. But I couldn't use Git or GitHub. And I think that that's a major difference between the open source learning community and the university learning community is practical versus theory and both have merits like I there's so much stuff I benefit from because I have a solid foundation in computer science but at the same time uh it's really nice to have practical courses that actually allow you to build things I, I find it kind of interesting I'm just fresh out of college but and I, I tweet every five minutes, basically. So my one of my most famous tweets is, I did a computer science degree and it did not make me a better coder. And I think the reason why it picked up so much is because people have this notion of someone who's done a CS degree would be by default a better coder, which I think is completely false. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I have some friends right now who are going through CS programs and I'm looking at the types of stuff they're doing in classes and it's just making me pull my hair out. Uh, so it's one thing I think it comes down to whether the college route is for you or whether the self-teaching route is whether uh, you're able to sit down and actually make it through courses and make consistent progress on your own. I think that for a lot of people going to a university course and having that structure might be a better alternative to doing the first two weeks of six different MOOCs and then dropping them. So I think it's all kind of up to the individual, which route's better. But I think if you can have discipline, you're motivated, you really can show up every day and be consistent that the self-learning route is so much better for yeah. a huge number of reasons. Even uh, like people would, it, it's it's not there yet, but uh, if I was hiring someone who's paid thousands of dollars to learn something versus someone who's done it for free by themselves with no financial or explicit uh, pressure on them, I'd and anyone would definitely go for the second person, given you have a fair system to assess both of these skills and they're assuming they're both equally skilled, I'd go for the second person. Yeah, me too, a hundred percent. But I don't think we should have illusions about, I think there's, you know, some percent of companies out there that are just not going to hire you if you've gone the self-teaching route. And for me, like, that's a good thing because I think I would have a culture clash with a place that couldn't look at what yep. my ability is, what my accomplishments are. And they say, no, we want someone else to say, you've got this certification. Uh, that's just not the environment that I think would be open to. Uh, really new concepts and fast change and, and machine learning, as you know, everything's dated after two years. So uh, even, it's important to be somewhere on the cutting edge. Not even two years, even if you like, fast year would be a bad example because they're pretty up to date with cutting edge, but look at how much the course has changed if you've taken two consecutive ones. And I think it's, it's true to anything. People assume that you're going to learn a lot of theory, which you will. And I'm not sure, I, I haven't seen anywhere where it's being applied. So usually, at least for me, the computer science degree involved a lot of electrical engineering concepts, which is, I assume, where the knowledge is derived from for computer science. Mm -hmm. And I just don't see them being relevant anywhere in the world right now. Yeah. 
and interestingly enough i i would uh, sincerely follow the programming courses or whatever i enjoyed but everything else i would pattern match my way into the exams i just pull out the past year papers pattern match the questions and still manage to get good grades so i'm not sure if that's a good area i think what you could do is and what worked okay for me is like try to supplement your courses i would enjoy the courses that seem practical and for everything else i would just blatantly ignore it and try to compensate my curiosity with online courses so if you are fortunate or unfortunate to be already enrolled in a degree or in a university just try to complement those ideas and if you feel this comment is irrelevant then i assume you're at a really good university yeah i'd say that's great advice i think you have a really unique perspective because you were doing university and online courses concurrently so you're in a much better position than i am to judge like which is better which is more relevant you know you were in i mean you're just finishing up now and also getting the opportunity to mix in all the latest stuff so you have a direct comparison and your conclusion is it's not going to make you a better coder you have to get out there and do it on your own if you're um, going to do machine learning put your money from the degree into a hardware which you're going to definitely need at some point or the other so can we talk about how did you get into self learning what was like the first online course you you took and when did you really kind of take off in that direction i think so uh, i figured out that the university courses aren't going to be that fun and i had this perspective of becoming a better coder which is why i signed up for a cs degree came back a few thousand kilometers to south india just to do that and in the first month or two i got completely disappointed just looking at the syllabus so i decided okay let me go ahead and join all student clubs because that's where the cool kids would hang out and that's what i did for a while i tried every single sub division of computer science again because there are like so many embedded systems machine learning came into that picture much later but uh, there were all of these different dimensions that i experimented with and at one point so uh, for for context i come from a town and even in india there wasn't a huge internet boom until recently a provider came along so i wasn't used to looking things up on the internet and so to speak i didn't even have a good internet connection always in my pocket that i could just pull out a smartphone and look things up and the internet boom happened right around the time i was in university and at that point i learned okay you can look things up on the internet as well and that's how i discovered i think one of the first courses i, I don't even remember which one it was might have been on coursera and i gave that a shot didn't complete it i remember that for sure fun fact i've never completed andrew ng's course even yeah so i started off in that direction and earlier i would mention this as a proud factor hey i've done 50 plus online courses i think it's a, it's a bad metric and bad example to set for everyone because that makes me look like hey i've done 50 courses and look at me i'm still an idiot i do i haven't figured out this field yet so that's that's what i did literally signed up for every single course that i found interesting until i found fast ai and even then i continued on that but maybe not as much and did you feel like as you went through that process you kind of refined your ability to choose classes to know how to retain the content things like that and can you talk about that a little bit i think so number one thing i realized was not every course is the best not every course at least online or i i would say even for university would have the best teacher and no one is going to hold my neck if i don't complete it or if i drop out of it now in india we don't have that option for university courses like we can't just drop out of them but for online courses you don't have to complete them and that realization was very relieving that okay if if i'm not enjoying a course let me just find another one or let me just find another way of gaining that knowledge and how did you end up holding yourself accountable because i think it's a very fine line between saying this course isn't useful to me i'm going to move on and making that as a conscious decision and saying ah uh, i don't know if i want to keep going with this and kind of talking yourself out of something that is actually beneficial so how do you make that decision to drop a course and uh yeah it's it's easy to say in retrospect i think now now and also now it's it's fairly straightforward for me to figure that out but 
I, I struggled with it, of of course, a lot when while I was going through the process, while I was very new, and I I think I still am, but while I was just fresh to the field, it, I struggled it with it a lot. But eventually, I started to realize, hey, maybe I spent if I spent fifty to hundred hours or more on trying something, and I absolutely have no clue of what I'm doing. It, it's not the best thing for me. and that's that's totally fine maybe maybe fast ai is in the course that you would enjoy that everyone so heavily recommends and if you put in the efforts talk to a few people tried all approaches maybe it's time to give up find another course yeah definitely about about accountability i think this uh, goes back to so i signed up for udacity's course which of course costs costs a lot and uh, i think i think it's it's not necessary but uh, so there you have a mentor who keeps tracking your progress and you accountable to them and after i completed it, it wasn't an immediate uh, realization but after i completed that and after a few months i joined the fast day boat where i met radek on the forums and through mm-hmm. his posts of making himself publicly accountable on the forums i i tr- i realized that okay this this is a very interesting thing to be accountable in public and really be vulnerable in public so to speak and i sort of followed his lead his his inspiration there and that that's how it started for me nice yeah the public accountability things are really good trick um another that i found and probably cuz i come from a background as an online poker player something that we've done uh, my friends and i to motivate ourselves is to when you've got something that you know you're fully capable of sticking to say it's working out 3 days a week but you feel like you're probably going to fall off of at some point is essentially telling your friends yeah i don't make these three workouts for the next month i'll give you $300 <laughs> you just make up some ridiculous amount it doesn't matter because if you do it right you're never going to pay it it's going to come time you're going to be tired you're not going to feel like working out but then you're going to compare that with your second option which is paying your friend $300 and you're going to go work out so uh you can also use that as leverage i'd recommend starting out small and not getting yeah. too much, but it's been a good trick for me uh to kind of it's a very similar thing to the public accountability uh just giving yourself a worse alternative than skipping out i think uh you also have a very interesting background and that's i i think you mostly self taught even in in your previous life where you did uh online poker games so how did you figure out how to remain disciplined throughout that process and i, I did not know this but i i just thought you go online you play and you earn money but later doing our offline conversations i realized you have to learn a lot you have to learn and apply and make money and figure out other things how how did you find that balance yeah it was a super beneficial process to me i think so much of what has helped me in the self learning today is directly related to stuff i learned when playing poker um we can talk a lot about it um you know you have to find a way to have a consistent routine you have to deal with the fact that you're your own boss and that any day is potentially a holiday so you can just yep. take off a day tomorrow this week this month uh except for the fact that you have to eat and uh you know you have a lot of ups and downs just like you'll have with coding coding can be very frustrating so can losing money every day for a week so you have to gener- uh kind of work to gain emotional control uh so there's so many things i learned from that uh setting my own schedule uh learning from others and it's especially hard i actually look at learning coding as a blessing because in the world of poker everyone's more or less competing so while you can yep. find people to help you out uh most of the people don't want to give you great information out there because you're all competing in the same ecosystem. And the second point is there's so much variance in a game like poker, it's very hard to separate the signal from the noise. So if you have a new technique or strategy you think might be good, what you have to do is go employ that for a month or 6 weeks and then check your results and see if you think it's working and you know, you could have just been unlucky for that month or you could have been really lucky and now you've learned a bad strategy whereas the contrast with the coding community is amazing. Everyone is super willing to help. all the information is just pushed out there and the information is pretty deterministic you can see yeah. very easily whether this thing works or whether it doesn't whether it's good advice or bad advice so i think that it's just super refreshing to be in a community of people that are all helping each other and all the good information kind of rises to the top and uh 
I think I think how you described approaching the problem is also similar to how you would do research or try things in an area. For example, you I know you're working on audio, but and I I know you're the one of few people who working on it at least from the fast air community. It's similar to doing audio research. You have no clue what you're up to, and you might not have any support either. People would might or would be helpful, but not really. And things might not work at all, even if you're investing efforts. Yeah, that's something where I think poker really honed my skills because what it comes down to is you're going to struggle and bounce around and things are going to be hard both in poker and coding and all that matters is the process. That's yeah. all you have control over. You show up every day and you work a set number of hours, you stay focused, you do what seems like the next best thing at the time for coding and either works or it doesn't, but that's that's all you can do and to I think people in the world of programming don't realize just how much variance there is. Like some days, you know, you're just going to be unlucky and you're going to get stuck with some bug and you're going to spend four hours wasting your day. You had a plan and an expectation that you're going to make this much progress. And then you're going to get in there and you're going to have some stupid bug. You're going to spend four hours Googling. And I think that derails a lot of people. That's really frustrating and hard for a lot of people. Um, I think especially when people take it personally and they think that others aren't going through yep. that same exact struggle. Uh, and that's something I realized kind of recently uh, because I host an open code night here in Kentucky. Okay. Uh, so I've got a lot of new coders coming in and the perception from them is that, you know, the struggle is going to go away. This is like a beginner thing. And it's like after three months, you just kind of know how to code and you're good. And I'm like, no, no, no. Every day. <laughs> Every day I'm stuck, like occasionally I have a great day where everything goes perfect, but you know, most of your time is spent dealing with something difficult. And if you even look at the very top people, you look at like Jeremy, who's live coding in front of 5,000 people and is just completely brilliant and has been coding for 20 years and knows everything. He's still constantly just making mistakes up there and being like, oh, now what's that doing? And just going back and fixing it. And it's, you just got to accept it. And it makes things so much easier when you don't make yourself feel bad about it. It's hard to do though. The the other side to it, and uh, I, I like to mention this, uh, at least for the grandmasters, I think f- from which all of us new tagglers are inspired and also intimidated by. So they're, they're grandmasters who take one year to become a grandmaster, maybe less. And what people miss out on the fact is it took them one year of being active on Kaggle to become a grandmaster, but you're missing out on all of their life outside of Kaggle through which all of the experiences that they gathered would have helped them. And who knows, like in in whatever walks of life, the skills that they would have picked would have helped them for sure. Or maybe, maybe they're just geniuses, which I think most of them are, but I think the experience is also helpful there. Yeah, I think it's absolutely all that background experience. You know, they come in really strong in one area, maybe statistical analysis, or maybe they're just rock solid coders. Um, and the machine learning stuff, they're able to pick up more fluidly because of all of that. So you've got this whole portfolio of skills. I mean, even the soft skills I was just talking about, like being able to wake up every day and go to your computer for a set amount of time, being yeah. able to not get distracted. Uh, those types of skills are things we don't think about that often, but have just as much impact on people becoming grandmasters. And um, so, yeah, you're right. They're ramping up zero to 100 in one year, but it's in this subset of the entire portfolio where they already have the rest of the pie complete. Yeah. You know, I don't think you see very often someone coming in who like doesn't code and doesn't have a heavy science background. And a lot of people coming in now are coming in from just that position. They For sure. you know, are just learning to code or uh, they're coming from a different field and they're reinventing themselves as a, machine learning researcher or practitioner and that's that's completely fine but you need to understand that it might be longer than you would expect or you might struggle with it which i i think everyone does like like you said so but the problem is everyone wants to be successful fast which is okay but what would you say if you had to advise people and push them in that direction how to be successful fast what types of things would you encourage them to do I don't honestly think that there's a cheat code to it. And I, I never set, I do set a lot of goals and that helped me set my direction, but I don't have a set hard 
top to reach or a thing to break for example even for this year i publicly said that i want to become a kaggle master which doesn't make me a master in any sense but it's it's a tier that i'm pretty close to and i know i can achieve in a year if i stay true to it and if i'm lazy of course i will not but i, I don't think there's any shortcut so to speak it's it's it takes a lot of efforts it takes a lot of discipline sacrifices just just being able to not hit control tab command tab if if you from osx background but and going to youtube watching songs watching funny stand up whatever drives your mind because that's of course more interesting and people are passionate that's why you want to do those things but it's all it's also easy to get distracted radik calls it the uh, curse of control plus t i think i think in, in one of his blog posts yeah that's that's a good way to label it so do you have any advice for avoiding that like what's your day like and how do you stay how do you structure it and how do you stay focused so i i don't micro set goals sometimes i do when when it's absolutely required when i have a hard deadline for example at work or otherwise or in my previous life where i was doing a lot of consulting i i usually structure it around my curiosity i let the curiosity drive the day around whatever things i have hard scheduled on my calendar so that's that's one way and then there are those macro goals which i always look at every day and they're also pinned at the top of my profiles everywhere so that even if anyone comes to it they know that this guy's an idiot he hasn't uh, completed them so that's that's always in the back of my head and i i also have them open in in a note tab or somewhere so just looking at those okay i haven't done anything related to kaggle in a while should i go to kaggle and i i personally feel like because i i'm juggling a lot of things together the podcast and other stuff blogging which again i haven't done anything for and i i want to write 52 blog posts this year so maybe i should now and just being able to juggle between those things and i i, I don't get burnt out because of that either I, again I, i don't have a good balance i think across them but i i, I have a structured day to day i i do wake up early and i do open my laptop right up so i don't have a life outside of this so to speak but beyond that beyond that it's completely curiosity driven and going cuz we have pretty different practices i'd say so how do you uh avoid burnout because for me i have like a very structured almost micro set and i start at a certain time and i let go of work at a certain time and i'm very much of the belief that i need to like close it try not to think about it until i come back the next day and i try and build with that just consistency i put in a set amount of time five days a week and i want to be able to do that for the next 10 years but knowing myself if i start letting myself jump into a competition say at 6 p.m. or uh you know checking work related stuff i'll i'll burn out but you seem to manage it and continue to be pretty consistent without those practices so you can talk about how you avoid burnout i i do think i keep getting burnt out every <laughs> almost every <laughs> other day and then i don't don't do anything for a day and i literally have nothing to do so i get keep coming back to it but i i feel like that's that's one thing that i really struggle with uh, this week uh, i had a screen time of close to 20 hours every day because i i'm doing a lot of interviews just this week and that's that's just ridiculous i i don't think i'd recommend that to anyone for me th- these are the things that i truly enjoy and i think it's it's not a good thing but the lines blur between my personal interests my work interests and things i'd like to do in the free time and that that creates this chaotic balance that i have to strive for so one thing one thing that i now enjoy is booking a fixed amount of hours in my calendar to go to the gym and like half time off the screen which has helped me like getting back to the screen also in some different ways but i think i i do keep struggling with fit burnout every now and then interesting well i do think we we agree on the part about uh keeping those things those macro goals in front of you the things that are important to you the things that you want uh from having led this local code group i've kind of noticed that is like the number one thing new people can do uh to keep on track is have some underlying goal project anything that's really driving you a passion i see almost a 
100% correlation. The people who were having trouble, like, oh, I'm learning Python, but you know, I started the course and then I dropped it. I say, well, what do you want to do with it? And they, yeah. they usually have an answer. And then on the other hand, I'll have some people, like I've got uh, a 12 year old kid in the class who's coming in and building games in Python. And every week he's just super excited about it. He wants to add new features. And that's what's driving the discovery of the next new thing that he needs to learn. Oh, I want to learn how to add a second character. And uh, the coding just follows naturally. So I think having something that drives you is like the number one thing For sure. that people can do. And if you, you know, if you're listening to this right now and you're saying, I don't really know what that is for me, like take some time, go sit down with a cup of coffee, no screen, a notebook, and just try and figure out why you're doing this. If this is even the right path for you, it might not be. Um, but look for those reasons, compile them and do what Sanyam does and then put them in front of you to remind yourself every day until it's just internalized because I think that's a huge difference between people who are consistent and successful. It's like you said, you wake up wanting to do it. This is yeah. like a plan for you. It's not, oh, I have to, you know, force myself. And I feel the exact same way. Like I really like coding, building stuff. I like the whole process of it, learning. I enjoy all of it. So it's really easy for me. Even, uh, I don't know why I burn out if that's the case. Uh, I do find that, but I don't want people to think that I come in and view work as work because I really do enjoy it. Um, I think that's something that can be learned and practiced too. I think sure. like noticing when you're getting frustrated and letting go of it, yeah. uh, all these things, these are like kind of the meta skills that are behind, you know, everyone's focused on learning Python, pandas, those things. But I think there are a lot of soft skills that go into it. So maybe have you found anything that you've uh, learned or whether it's something like a mental set or whether it's something like a soft skill, uh, like, keyboard shortcuts that have just made your life a lot easier and you're really glad that you learned them in in terms of uh, generally speaking or uh in terms of like your life is now easier as a coder uh so like one example i gave was just learning keyboard shortcuts instead of like trying to do everything with the mouse uh, you know, that pays dividends throughout your entire day, no matter what you're doing, whether you're doing pandas or PyTorch or Python or JavaScript, uh, your life is just going to be easier. And it's like, it's almost like a, at the top of the pyramid because it just helps all those other things. Yep. Uh, kind of same with exercise, uh, as you were saying, like that time away from the screen where you go and just let your body reset probably really helps the other 18 hours of the day where you're just killing yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah well, if you can talk about like any things that you've been you've kind of learned and then been like oh why didn't i learn this two years so, ago i i promised myself to and i think it's similar to how you just throw out the instructions of the box but i promised myself and i, I keep myself accountable to search the documentation for 10 minutes before i google and then google for at least 20 minutes before i go to posting any questions or asking anyone and usually somewhere between five to 25 minutes in those five to 25 minutes, I'm able to find my answer depending on how sleep deprived I am. I, I think and th that's, that's the best thing that's helping me right now. And secondly, I think I used to be really fancy about maybe I should try a new editor. Maybe I should try something new. And now I'm just trying to go with whatever I'm used to, which for now is Jupiter because I come from a fast AI world and just trying not to be very fancy about it but just learning only absolutely as much as I need to, if I don't need to know a shortcut, I, I'm not sure if it's the best approach. I don't go out and learn new shortcuts, just stick with it and stick true to whatever I want out of the notebook rather than trying to figure out more fancy things around it. And the, the, the reason I, I say that is because there, there's a fine balance to it. You should know a few things, but that's not your primary goal. Those are supposed to help you and you shouldn't just spend time on learning how to use Jupyter Notebook. It's, it's supposed to help you and not eat away your time. I, I think those those two things are, are my primary ones. It's interesting. I think uh, I agree on some points and disagree on others. I think mm -hmm. there's one thing that really helped me with consistency and like, you know, not being overwhelmed with the infinite amount of stuff that you just have to learn as a data science machine learning person. Yeah. It, I took the viewpoint how would I order it? And what would I do if I was going to be doing this every day for the next 10 years? 
because that's what I plan to do. Um, so, you know, certain things may seem like diversions and they can be for people just getting started. But for instance, like you said, Jupiter and mastering the stuff that it has to offer, yep. you know, say that takes you four to six hours of your time and you're going to spend a thousand hours in Jupiter over the next five years. Uh, I think the tipping point for me is whether it's going to be a net time savings. So if I, if my Jupiter is going to be 5% more productive, I'm saving 50 hours. Therefore it's worth it for me to invest that time. That being said, you kind of have to not just try and learn everything at the beginning. You have to, you know, maybe do something like devote 15% of your time or 10% of your time to making things smoother and more efficient. Yeah. Um, getting better I, with the software uh, and then the 85% with the stuff that really interests you. And that is your kind of core day to day. I, I would agree on that. And I, I think it's also similar for me right now. I am exploring the widgets and that's, that's, so these are the things that I, I switch to when I'm bored of something. So I think it's useful, like you said, to keep 10, 15% of your time for just exploring things outside of it. And I was inspired by this through Jeremy, who I think sets aside a lot of his time of every single day to learn new things. So maybe you, you don't have that much time, but I, I'm pretty sure everyone could set aside half an hour to one hour of their day, out of the family time, standard job, whatever, to learn something new, to kaggle. And that definitely compounds. Like I, I don't think we have to even debate that if you keep setting aside that fixed amount of hours. So that being said, how do you choose what to do next? Like, how do you choose how to spend that hour? Do you have a conscious process or? So I usually have, and I used to be very fancy about the apps that I would use. Now just use uh, Apple's notes because I have all of the Apple devices. So it's, it's the convenience that I can pull out my iPad or iPhone and I'd have it on there. And I usually have a list of different things that I want to explore frameworks, uh, competitions, blog posts that I'm yet to read, research papers that I'm yet to read, books that I'm yet to read, courses that I'm yet to explore. And so, and I have those titles labeled across the notes for anyone who's ever used an Apple device. So I just scroll through that and whatever I enjoy, because these are things I'm doing out of enjoyment and for, for the learning part, just, just setting aside time for that. I click on it, whatever's in that list that excites me at that point of time, just click on it, start reading, start exploring, start coding around it. Again, it's, it's, it's unstructured, but completely curiosity driven. And that, that helps me avoid burnout. I think in, in that case. Yeah, I could see that we have similar, I have a slightly different, I kind of try and look for like the optimal, uh, which I don't know if that is itself is optimal, but I look at like, what's the, next best thing I could learn, what would bring me the most gain for the least amount of time that I can do right now. Um, which brings me to another point, like a really good thing that stuck in my head recently is what to do when you don't know what to learn next. Uh, I, and, yeah, go so, ahead. So I, I always have a backtrack of ideas now because, uh, if, if you're active on Twitter and if you follow enough people from the machine learning world, you will have an overflow of ideas, obviously, and you can yourself filter them out. You will of course use them to filter out the complete overflow of the field. But if you follow the right people, you I'm assuming have the right knowledge at your disposal. And I just keep setting tabs on them through the notes that I just talked about. And that leaves me with enough options to explore or uh, just scrolling through Reddit every day, just scrolling through the fast day forums every day. There, there's plenty of ideas out there that I personally, I don't think I have the time to explore. So I find myself always at, at a backlog of ideas. And what would you say you do? Cause this is a, you've talked a lot about the infinite learning loop and seeing all these things and just jumping in and learning stuff that you might not necessarily need right now. And you also might not necessarily need ever. It might be a kind of cool new thing, a new framework. Uh, so how do you avoid that kind of loop of just jumping into things that you actually might not need or you're not sure about? I think I, think I have a high BS filter now of things I want to avoid. 
so if if i'm into a course i'd usually skip the introductory parts because for every machine learning course out there the first five chapters are always the same those three annoying ann networks that you get and followed by a lecture on back propagation before they get to the meat and usually right now i'm not taking a lot of courses but i'd usually skip that and get right to the lecture that i need to know so just the, having the comfort in my mind of i can take the most important lecture right away and if i don't understand anything then i'll go back which again leaves you in a loop but maybe not the infinite learning loop which uh, i keep talking about because i i think many people need to know it i keep seeing people falling into it yeah it's definitely a real phenomenon <laughs> do, uh, do you do you find yourself falling into that loop or how, how do you avoid it how how's the all learning approach like uh i would say i avoid it i constantly have the temptation of like i should go do this there's this awesome course or opportunity or thing that would um make me feel better if i did it and uh i think that's something you really have to watch out for as a practitioner is if you're a productive person i think that for most productive people that's a really subtle form of procrastination doing yep. the thing that's not the most important but the thing that you know you'll be successful at it won't be that hard you'll go do it you'll feel like you accomplished something but it's not the absolute most important thing you could be doing at this moment so being really honest with yourself and the way i avoid it is actually through some rituals and practices i have uh so i do a weekly reflection where i just set aside a block of time on sunday uh to try and look every week i do it and look at uh how the past week went what stuff i intended like what did i say last sunday i was going to do this week did i do it how did it go uh what did i learn what do i want to do for the week going forward i can go a bit more into detail into that process later uh but the point is that that it's easy to kind of delude myself in the moment when i'm opening a browser and doing something i didn't plan to do and going and trying a new course or something like that that just kind of popped up in my screen but when i sit down and just really focus and look at what i wrote the week before and look at what i'm doing now it's really hard for me to delude myself and to not see what truly is the important thing so i think having uh that process for planning and reflection is just one of the most important things to me um it's super beneficial i think that that's part of a larger cycle i wanted to talk about of kind of how i have found my way through this totally crazy situation we're all in of trying to figure out what to do next and yeah. how to make your own path when you know you can't see where you're going to be a year from now you can't see where you're going to be 6 months from now so how do you decide and the process i've fallen upon is basically looking around trying to find the next best move or what looks like the next best move jump and do that for a week or two weeks make you know just short term commitments and then the reflection step which is look back you know from my new vantage point what should i do next and then adjust your strategy and if you just repeat that cycle over and over and kind of iterate through it you will just find success i think fairly quickly yeah. um i think a lot of people uh tend to lack that reflect and adjust step so they'll say you're trying to uh gain control of your physical health and you want to start exercising you know most people take the first step they you know once or twice a year they come up with a plan they say i'm going to go to the gym this time it's going to be different i'm going to run 5 miles every day and they come up with their plan and they do it and they go and the first 2 or 3 days or 2 or 3 weeks they are successful at it but it eventually at some point things break down maybe they have a family emergency or maybe their body's too sore to go back in the gym and they didn't account for something and they considered that a failure because they fall off and they stop doing it. Yeah. But that's not failure. That is the point where you just say, "Oh, well the initial plan I had didn't work. How can I adjust it and try again going forward?" And if immediately at that point they say, "Oh, well I guess I'm really sore, maybe I should be doing less and focusing on consistency." And then they try that, and maybe 2 weeks later they realize, oh, "I'm not losing any weight. I need to up it." And you just go through that cycle. and you'll find your way doing that i i think and you you've been recently engaged so you might relate to this better but i i call it since you in love with the process what do you do after the honeymoon period runs out 
you need to keep the marriage strong how do you continue doing that how do you continue reevaluating that process and it's it's a process it's it's like you said it's an iterative process you constantly need to work towards it it's not a hunky dory situation yeah i think um staying in touch with your original motivation exactly. both in relationships for romantic advice like <laughs> staying focused on it's very easy over time the honeymoon period ends because you stop focusing on the amazing things about the person because your brain's very good at filtering out what it already knows yeah and it starts focusing on the things maybe the 2% of things you don't like in the relationship and if you can keep your focus on the 98% then you're going to be fine you're going to be grateful you're going to be really happy about the situation you're in you're going to realize how lucky you are but with the and the same applies for coding if you're allowing yourself to get frustrated, derailed if you're overworking uh and you're not spending time really looking at your progress, how far you've come. And I think that's a really common illusion I caught myself doing that the planning helped with yeah. that that reflection. One of the things I do is go through and actually list out what I accomplished that week. And I think it's really easy, especially when you're really kind of hard on yourself and trying to do your best and be good fast. you don't notice all the stuff all the progress you are making unless you explicitly kind of write it out cuz i've had a lot of weeks where i was like wow that was i just threw that week in the trash i just didn't do what i planned to do yeah uh, i really failed this week and i go through that process and i start writing down what i actually did and i'm like oh my god i actually have like eight things on this list that are you know fairly substantial so i think taking time to each week to celebrate the things you have done that just rejuvenates you and keeping in touch like we said with the things that drive you why you're doing it those two celebrating progress uh and then keeping in touch with your underlying reasons those are the two i think that will keep you from uh, i guess leaving the honeymoon period for, for the record also if if you're just starting out that list could be completely blank because again you're trying to find things that you you could be better at or you just new to the field you need to understand that and things you would have accomplished compound over time it's 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 not a linear process for sure and initially you'll struggle a lot that's why not everyone is a data scientist even if they want to be that's why it, it takes so much efforts to become a kaggle grandmaster even though every single person out of the 3 million i think that have signed up on kaggle eventually might want to become a grandmaster and you you just need to acknowledge embrace the process i think yeah i think embrace the process is the number one uh, i do want to clarify my accomplishments on this list my eight accomplishments for the week are not like these grand you know i got a gold medal in the kaggle competition a lot of them are like you know i finished two lectures in this course uh i learned how to use a new framework or i tried i made progress on this blog piece and then personal stuff too you know uh i helped my mom like get her house in order i went to the gym 3 times this week and just mm -hmm. you know anything you're going to have accomplishments at every level that's one of the best things about being a beginner is you have like all that low hanging fruit you just get to grab it's a really fun time you make progress much faster than you do once you have spent a few years in and there's kind of more marginal gains to be made uh so i think that um it's really fun being a beginner and yeah. people should just really like the fact that you're going to progress faster than will be possible in 2 years and kind of embrace the process that's the best way to put it i i'm curious how do you avoid burnout in those micro i i know you do micro setting of goals but how do you avoid burnout where you miss the goals i i i constantly get irritated by that fact is is there any trick you found that helps you so i don't set i don't set non process related goals generally <laughs> And if I do, I try and not attach to them. So if I say I want to have this thing th done by this date, I look more on the inputs. Like, what's it going to take to do that? Oh, I'm going to have to work from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. Bad. 12 p.m. Four hours, not <laughs> 16 there. Uh, <laughs> with heavy focus, I'm not going to allow myself to get distracted. And if I show up and do that, and I don't reach my goal, I don't get upset. Like, problem wasn't that. I failed to reach my goal it was that I failed to set a good goal if I showed up and did every step in the process and I didn't meet my goal then that's not me failing at the goal that's me failing at setting it 
Um, but yeah, like you said, focus on the process um, and be really uh, compassionate with yourself. That's something I had to work on a lot as someone who um, used to try and make all these big changes in my life. And inevitably you have these setbacks and failures. And I thought at the time that, you know, I, it's good to be hard on yourself because if you're not hard on yourself, you're not going to change. And what I actually think to be true now is that if you're really hard with yourself and you kind of beat yourself up, you're going to avoid the path entirely. You're not going to want to reflect. You're going to associate trying and failing with pain. And so what's going to happen is you're not going to look back and try and adjust. You're going to let it go for four months and then you're going to try and jump back in and you're going to repeat that process. So I think, again, celebrating like small victories, things like that, and just accepting uh, really it's not, we're talking about all this struggle in day to day and the problems, like when you're trying to debug something, you're stuck on it for four hours. That's just part of the process. There's no way around it. And if you accept it, it ceases to be struggling. There's not pain. If you're just like, this is okay. If you just go with it, then you take away a lot of that cost and a lot of that burden on yourself. So I think there's a lot of control that you can have, but through, um, not beating yourself up and, uh, self care. You know, if you really do feel yourself starting to get frustrated, get up and go to the gym or go for a walk or go play with your dog. And I, I know you're a huge propeller of this also. So I, I think you made an explicit decision about an year ago after you read the book, deep work by, uh, I, I forget the author, but did you find that useful to just focus on the problem for a few hours and not do anything not get tempted into opening up your laptop back after it up. Did, did that help you or do you still find yourself struggling with that? Both. I think it's, I know it on an absolute intellectual level. The best way for me to work is to uh, get up at a set time each day, get up at seven. I have a routine I go through in the morning to kind of uh, get myself ready. Uh, that's because every day when you roll out of bed, it's just a complete roll of the dice, how you're going to feel. Um, you know, one day you're going to wake up feeling extra tired. One day you're going to wake up feeling good. And I needed a way to be able to show up by my computer at eight o'clock and be focused. And I found that having like a short routine and whatever it is, it's going to be different for different people uh, to kind of, if I do wake up really tired to, by the time I get to my computer, be feeling pretty good and ready to go. Um, but that's an aside back to the deep work. Yeah, I'm pretty structured in my day. So what I actually do is usually get to work about eight o'clock. Uh, I set 25 minute timers on my phone where I just have absolutely no distraction, all notifications turned off. And I just work intensely on a goal for 25 minutes. And I take a five minute break. Uh, that duration, there's nothing important about it. You can do 15 minutes, you can do five minutes. Um, but the point is, I work in this kind of intense cycle trying to do the most I possibly can. And I do that for about four to six hours. And then after that, I'm just completely done. And I've experimented with both ways, the four to six hours way where I'm really focused. Uh, I personally, I don't think anyone really can maintain that level of focus for 10 yep. to 12 hours. So what ends up happening is if I end up working 10 to 12 hours and kind of letting things go, I'm just doing it at about 50% efficiency and I'm really not getting any more done. Uh, then plus the fact that I end up getting burnt out, it's just a net negative for me. So it's kind of hard to believe, but for me personally, limiting my work days. And again, this is not like my entire work day, but it means my, my core, most important things, my knowledge work. Um, like, so if I'm working on a audio machine learning framework, like something's really challenging, uh, just putting all my energy right there and, um, doing that in four to five hours, I get as much done as I feel I would if I spent 10 hours at kind of half efficiency. And there's no, there's no alternative. I don't feel that 10 hours of just super focused, uh, at least not for me and my, my experience would work. So yeah, I really advise people to experiment with that and consider all of these things as variables in your self learning process that you can play with and try out. Uh, uh, focus is a muscle. It's something you build up. Yep. It's, it's not something that, you know, you're just born with or aren't. Uh, so I think trying to find ways to practice it um, 
really help out. Do you have any advice on like staying focused, avoiding distraction, any tips and tricks? I, I don't think I have a good advice on it because uh, I, I, I was just thinking of it as, as you were talking about it. But for me, the struggle point is, honestly speaking, I don't have a life outside of all of these things I do that are already publicly visible. And I know you're familiar with all of them. So I find it really hard to draw the line. For example, this podcast, I'm really enjoying it. It's not work for me, so to speak. Editing becomes work for sure. I absolutely don't like that process a lot. But not being able to draw the line sort of makes it really hard for me to do the deep work because I don't know what, where do is the enjoyment part and where's the work part. Both overlap more than 70% for me. For, for distractions, I think... Again, the goal setting when it comes into the picture, for example, for our podcast and for every podcast that I do, I try to jot down the ideas. And usually my uh, goal is to like have them ready much before the call. And that's, that's that becomes a goal in itself. So just knowing that and uh, whatever my schedule would be, I try to get that done in three or four hours. So again, mm-hmm. those hours, so to speak, become deep work, right? Because now... I'm on the line. I'm going to be on fire if I don't complete that. And th- I think that's that's where I find the... And we joke about it, at least in, in Indian means that the engineer attitude, the procrastinating coder attitude, where you don't do it until you absolutely need to. And that really pushes you to a lot of efficiency, so to speak, because when you know every single minute counts, then you really try to put in all of your efforts. I think... Not sure if that's the best process because that also brings a lot of stress in. But procrastinating until I absolutely need to do something helps for me in in a really funny way. Yeah, that's an interesting... I hadn't thought of it in that light that I'm to some extent doing that by compressing the time. Um, But at the same time, it's really interesting from your perspective. Like you're doing so many different things. You're like absolutely prolific with blogs, with the podcast. Uh, and all the different stuff you're working on. Uh, Do you think that having that pressure is kind of a key to your success? It's like, do you think that you'd be able to do just one or two of them? Or do you think that having all of that combined and having that kind of constant pressure of a deadline is what makes you able to do what you do? I I think you're being too kind. I, I still struggle with doing a good job at these, very honestly speaking. And I could point out to public instances also that do uh, justify this. For example, the interview that I did with Jeremy, I didn't correct the thumbnail. And that was the, I think, 52nd interview that I did. So I am not good good at this thing, even though I do it almost full time. But uh, again, I think, yeah, the, the deadline setting fashion where I've publicly promised to deliver two podcast episodes every week creates a deadline, right? And... I also have to find people to make sure that I'm able to continue running it. I need to do all of the process. And again, it's it's curiosity driven, but it's also deadline driven. So if I am almost brain dead and I'm almost very sleepy, I go down to doing the subtitles, which also I do now. And that's not very involving for me. Or I'd edit and finish or wrap up something, for example, Again, so that's where the curiosity comes in. And that's also where the deadlines come in for me because I deliver the episodes every Thursday and Sunday, 9 a.m. PT, no matter what. So I know if I keep procrastinating and if I'm not in the mood, if I get to it by 8.30 PT, I need to complete it in half an hour, which has also happened many times, even despite the fact that I would have already recorded the episode one month ago. And I've been procrastinating so much that those 30 minutes, I really squeeze out my efficiency, listen to the episode at 5x speed, fix the subtitles, make sure it goes out at 9 a.m. And so I got two questions. First, <laughs> what are you doing from 7 to 8.30 there? Are you just, are you working on something else or are you like probably on YouTube kind of procrastinating in that way? Are you hanging out with friends? Like what's the hour and a half leading up to that? All, all, all of those, I think. So I might be reading a blog post and continuously looking at the time, getting stressed out, okay, 30 minutes to go, 20 minutes to go, 10 minutes to go. 
and i keep scrolling while monitoring the time or i'm watching a video let me go back watch another one then do it it's 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 not something smart that i do it's just things that i am enjoying and if i don't like a process i'll keep pushing it forward until i absolutely need to for example the subtitling it's it's not the most enjoyable part but it's necessary for me to be able to have it there for the non native english speakers which is a large number now for the podcast so yeah that it it it's it's it, it's there in that sense uh i was also wondering do you think that you could set an artificial deadline that wasn't like a true life deadline like you could mentally say i'm going to have it done a week in advance but it has to be done by this time and i don't think so honestly speaking i don't think so at all because again it's it's so many things for me the the real deadline is what makes sense and i don't think any artificial deadline would matter because i know that it's an artificial deadline and i had again go back to my roots which is being very lazy which is being a big time procrastinator of it so i don't do that i i know that i need to put out the episode and i would have the episode in mind for example and i i think the podcast is good a good example so that's why i'm nagging on it but so whenever i find the mood or the head space to be able to do it i just complete it then and there which could be a week ago or which could be 10 minutes ago varies a lot right but then if it does come up on the deadline you find the head space and you you get in that zone because you have to then i have to <laughs> oh. and i i think i i picked this up while freelancing in college and college was a really frustrating moment for me because i did not enjoy the syllabus for a large part and i was also working working for clients who had real deadlines and contracts signed enough to send me off to prison worst case scenario although that's not realistic and if i'm really frustrated throughout my day i wouldn't be able to code for sure and if i have the deadline next day i need to wake up at 2 am work up until 9 am not advisable don't en- i i'm not encouraging it but that's what i would have to do if i need to make that money or if i need to keep that client happy so to speak so that's what i would do and that's that's the thing that i think has just continued for me since that is impressive <laughs> do you think uh so how old are you i'll be 23 this year <laughs> yeah so that's incredible that you've done what you've done you're turning 23 i'll be 33 this year so i think maybe that's part of what the contrasting outlook is i remember in college like the same thing just you know if you have to get 3 hours sleep get 3 hours sleep and uh it's a different world for me now so i think that'll be good to have that contrast because we'll probably have listeners sure. in their 20s and then listeners in their 30s and upwards and for, for the record i i don't have a life outside of this i don't socialize as much not that i get the chances to and not that i prefer to i'd always default to doing something stupid on the internet or otherwise so all of my time active time waking hours are spent on things around the things that i am doing and most of them are publicly visible so to put things into perspective i don't have a family that i need to take care of i don't mm-hmm. have other responsibilities that i need to take care of i can pay rent by default so i don't have to worry about that every single day and that that gives me the head space to do all of these stupid things that i am able to do right now yeah i think that's an incredible i'm in the same situation that i've got the freedom to focus on this stuff you know i don't have kids and i um i think that gives a lot of openness to uh the pursuit of this and it's a reason that i've been able to progress fairly fast um do you have any advice or do you know any people who uh come from a different background who are going through a programming uh self teaching who might have kids or might have a job in another field where they're not able to practice uh do you know anyone along those lines i think it would be great to give some advice but i don't think you know we're necessarily the people to do it yeah. <laughs> so i, I am definitely the bad duck <laughs> but i i think radik radik uh, from fast ai is the best example for it and he he's a hero to the complete community and i'll have him on the show soon so audience do check out that episode whenever it comes out but he's already the man of the family and 
he jumped onto the machine learning boat after already being in the family situation and he'd already constantly talk about it where he'd be learning stuff on his phone while playing with his baby and uh, this this is something i know it's already there out in the public so even for him i think and he's already mentioned it's it's it does involve a lot of burnout and i think it's it's part of a process where you really trying to get good at something not out of the absolute need of it but because you're so passionate about it and i i think it's it's always hard to find a balance for such situations but uh, radik is the best example that i i can think of nice i think that'll be good to have him on and get that kind of contrast and i think that's a huge thing that we haven't talked about is mentoring or even just finding people who are uh kind of match your background and circumstances yeah. and see how they did it and trying to find someone to kind of model after uh did you have anyone when you were starting out who you looked at and said i want to be like that or i want to do what they did not when i started out for sure i would al- always seek advice a lot at college from my professors who again had no clue about deep learning actually the reason i got into deep learning was because they told me it's a project for people doing a phd and you won't be able to do it i was like okay i'm going to do this let's see and that's what made me sign up for all of the online courses that i did so maybe the rebel out of the group but after after i went to the online forums and i learned how to ask respectfully from people that that's when i figured out okay all of these amazing people from the community can be very helpful but uh, i i know you had many mentors so i i think there's an interesting story there also from your end yeah no i've had i i feel like i've had like a just been mentored by the community in general uh you know i've had some people who've really reached out and helped me like i mentioned uh, harry bloom uh baz on the forums has just like i get stuck i go to him he just helps me with all kinds of stuff uh and it's made my path a lot smoother and a lot easier um but aside from that i've really just tried to look out at people who have done exactly what you've done which is to walk the path and then to write about it and then listening to those people you know for instance you wrote how not to do fast ai <laughs> and i read that before i took fast ai and said oh these are things i I'm going to listen to this advice from this person who's in a similar circumstance and who just took the class and I think that's a really important part of self-teaching too is just not uh making avoidable mistakes by learning from others who have done stuff um because you'll just shorten your time down that it takes to go through the process if you uh learn and it's really cool because this whole community is building each year there's a fast AI there's a new group of people Yeah, who yeah. have access to the past generations resources and who take that and write about it and so we just keep getting better and better guides more and more concise and it's slowly evolving and it's just really cool i think at a certain point we might even have like almost a singular resource for each thing where we can say here's the best thing to go learn jupiter here's the best thing for pandas cuz right now i don't know how you feel but i feel like i just kind of scramble around and find stuff and it's really hard when you're a beginner to know what a good resource is and what isn't uh because you don't have the knowledge that you're trying to judge so it really takes someone having walked through the path and looking back and saying this will help you for where you're at and you know Jeremy talks a lot about that Jeremy and Rachel saying uh you know you can add a ton of value even if you're a beginner just by writing and explaining concepts to yourself 3 months ago 6 months ago because you know someone who's been familiar with these concepts for 5 years isn't going to be able to explain them as well to someone who is just starting out because once you internalize a concept you lose the perspective of why it was difficult in the first place um so i think this is something that i've really slacked on my intention uh when i read your blog was i'm going to do fast ai i'm going to commit to it and i'm going to write about it and i've written almost nothing so that's like my major regret from the past year uh but i would encourage other people not to make the same mistake and jump in and do you know the types of stuff that you've done i think uh, not not ahead. to not to trash anyone but uh, that's where people mess up you mentioned about writing about concepts 
most people find something interesting and uh, they try to write it because it's trending just because you might get more views which makes sense but that's not what fast a really suggests what they talk about is okay you went through the pain of understanding how the api had been created and if you want to maybe talk about it now that you slightly know how it works go ahead and write it down see how that refines your thoughts and that's what they are really aiming for not that okay maybe this is trending in today's week situation let me try and write about that just to get more traction again it, it depends on your end goal if if you there to learn you might benefit from the other approach better than if you there just to build a audience yeah i agree 100% i think you need to focus on uh what's most important to you and what will be most important to others not just what's trending at the moment and if you do that you'll build an audience organically if you can provide value to people people will come to you and they'll send people to you it's there's nothing wrong with it being a natural process whereas if you try and jump on what's trending and you're constantly doing that you won't really be adding value and you'll get a lot of views initially but you won't get a lot of people who are kind of loyal uh subscribers who just check out your all of your content you just you just being a news channel like i might flip through you if if it becomes boring at any point what's that so if you're scrolling through your tv and you keep finding if you're going through the news channels and you get bored of one you just move on to the other one where you can find more information you you sort of become that flow of information in in the other situation yeah definitely and there's also the it kind of clogs the the pipes a bit so that it's hard for people to find the truly helpful resources so um just keeping that in mind like it's okay to write about popular topics and to try and build an audience but doing so just i would advise people um or suggest because i have no actual experience or background maybe you can talk on this a little bit more but just add value and try and add value and good things will come your way and that's something i've always felt to be true about you from having talked to you in all of our private conversations uh from even when i was very first starting out your attitude was always how can i help it was maybe i can connect you with this person if you do that let me know and i will uh help you share it with people and you were always just focused on adding value and i think that's one of the reasons you have been as successful as you have been is because you weren't trying specifically just to get clicks i think again again you being too kind but uh, what i tried to do was pass on the attitude that i received from the forums even from jeremy and rachel and silvin themselves so everyone that goes on to the forums is treated as a potential world class future deep learning practitioner and never treated as a student even though we get that title by default and th- there's a fine difference there if if you're talking to a student you'll have a different attitude versus if you're looking at a world class practitioner and if you treat everyone with that respect and this is the attitude that i received from the core people the family the fast a family that i like to call and i i feel a responsibility to continue for putting that forward to everyone that i meet on the forums or anyone that reaches out to me so i i'm just trying my best to do that with even the podcast now that i get to broadcast it so to speak or even even at a personal level if if i ever get the chance but i i think this this one fine way to it also and i know you master it of how to respectfully ask for advice online not just they, they they there's two things to it and you could you could be annoying to an extent and you could be very respectful how, how did you find that balance yeah i it might have been you who actually pointed it out to me initially the the concept we're talking about is when you are you know it's totally fine to ask for help and it's there's so many people willing to help but the one uh responsibility you have as someone asking for help is to make sure that uh the help is actually needed in the first place and what i mean by that is you know all the people mentoring and helping on the forums have a limited amount of time and so if you can if your problem you haven't worked on it a little bit or at least googled it you know if it's solvable by a google search uh <laughs> it's not a, i wouldn't recommend asking your mentor about it uh that's a responsibility of a mentee is to uh take the time the mentor is there to help you avoid banging your head against the wall for hours 
for a bug that they've already seen in the past or that they know how to solve. But at the same time, they're not there. They're not Google. They're not <laughs> there to save you from finding information that should be easily accessible. Uh, so I think just stopping before reaching out to people, and I fail at this all the time. Uh, Harry can attest to that. I'll send him messages on Telegram. I'll just be like, how do you do this and get... And then I just realized that's literally, I can just type that into Google and it'll pop up Stack Overflow, 7,000 upvotes, the line's right there. <laughs> and so I just delete the message and it's like, sorry. Uh, so it'll happen. It's not, it's not a big deal. Like if someone asks me that type of question, uh, it's going to happen from time to time. It's not a big deal at all. But try to avoid it being a pattern of uh, try and use the amount of time people are sharing with you as if it were a precious resource. I think I think there, there are two sides to it. So for example, and we, we've tried to work on things together. So when someone goes out and explicitly agrees to help you, then you can ask for advice at a micro level also. Or if you're going to go ahead and post macro level questions, you need to show that you've done the homework. And it's completely fine that you've done a few Google searches and you don't understand what that gibberish contextualized short acronyms mean. Just tell us that, hey, I looked this up. I found this result. I did not understand this. Could you help me? And maybe the person, so what you need to take away from there is how do you learn how to learn yourself rather than always coming back to asking other people because if if it gets annoying, no one for sure is going to help you. Yeah, that's a really good clarification that um, it is okay to ask for help in those circumstances, but just try and make it as concise as possible um show you know errors or relevant code stack trace it's it's really annoying i see on the forums a lot you know uh jeremy and sylvan trying to help out and someone will post i had this error they don't post the error they don't post the relevant code and then it wastes the time because the person responding has to be like can you post a stack trace can you post error messages and then they come back and it just um so trying to just get in the habit of saying, how can I make this concise, easy to understand and do my side of the work? And then everyone else, if you do that, everyone else will gladly meet you halfway and, you know, even go out of their way to help you. I found the community to be For sure. people are over the top helpful. And it's really cool. Cause like you said, you saw it from the generation before you, and then it teaches you how to give to the people coming forward. So like, that's why I started a local coding group here to help people learn how to code. Um, and that's why I try and reach out and help people who are just getting started in audio. Um, I maintain the, a thread on the forums as well as a couple telegram chats and just trying to, uh, pay it forward continuously. And it's awesome because the community just keeps growing, keeps getting more knowledgeable and it's just good for everybody. I think the, the best part about the community is so people also the fast day community has a personal aspect to it. And people always mention that, hey, I'm really not able to get my head around this. And I struggle with two days. And someone wouldn't just answer your question with, you can Google this and you'll find out the answer. But they'll be like, hey, that's completely fine. It's it's a hard thing. That's completely okay. It might take you longer. But here's how you do it. Just adding that little personal push might make a world of a difference. And it has to me at least. And I think every one of us, I, I know f for your example, also tries to pay it back in that sense. Yeah, definitely. And uh, one other thing I want to add is that it's not completely, I get a lot out of teaching. Like when I sit down with someone and try and teach a concept, uh, I always learn new stuff. Um, they just try things that I just wouldn't think to try. And as a result, uh, you know, I end up learning new things about how different functions work, how different libraries work. Um, or I under, I learned that I had an incomplete understanding of a concept when I go to explain it and they ask a question and I say, I actually don't know that. <laughs> Let me search it. So it'll really help. Like, you know, I'm not going to go back and look at every last thing about Python arrays and like Python lists, basic things. Um, but through helping other people to learn those things, I eventually uncover those little bits of knowledge that I uh, was either mistaken on or didn't know in the first place. So I think it's, you know, beneficial for both sides. I really think teaching just, I learn a ton. So I really would recommend it. If you're not doing it just to help other people out, do it for yourself. 
it's it's not a hard requirement for sure and i i think you touched upon a very important topic we don't teach teach we it's it's sort of passing on your passion and realization about all of these ideas to a new person who could use that help to skyrocket them towards where you're at and i think there there different ways to it for to give another example rade creates uh, or used to create the kaggle starter packs so he's not out there teaching everyone but he's creating those starter packs that create a substitute for them or now he's creating the quizzes around fast day that again is a substitute to it and these things give you the knowledge back in 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 different ways that that only are realized after you do them yeah absolutely the same with making a tutorial you know a tutorial is essentially mentoring someone except at scale because now 10,000 people can consume it without your time and i'm sure you've had this when you're writing up uh about a paper you've read you'll be explaining something and then you'll realize the part you don't actually understand and then you go back and say okay i need to learn this so that i can explain it to others and it really is a good way to take an inventory of how well you understand something as you try and explain it you'll just inevitably hit those parts that you maybe can't uncover on your own but that you don't actually understand yet so yeah that's a great piece of advice is um you know you can it doesn't have to be uh one on one or even replying on the forums it can just be producing resources uh that you think would help people understand a really core or important topic i i call it the 10 rupee 10 rupees for context is uh not even do, not even in dollar i'm trying to convert it in my head but i i don't know how much the amount is uh it's 1/6 of a dollar so i call it the 10 rupee test 10 rupee chai test where you buy a friend of yours a 10 rupee chai and mm-hmm. while they're trying to sip it you sort of do a elevator pitch of your tutorial and do it at a very very meta level which wouldn't work for any technical conversation but if it's a high level overview and if they are able to understand it just because they're obliged to since you bought them a coffee or a drink and if they nod their head and if they ask you a question back after it you've passed the test and that that's how i smoke test my ideas now interesting and do you do that with people who are in the field or do you do it with people who are outside completely outside uh, oh. maybe le- even not even technical people if if it's a very general idea that i'm writing about yeah i do that that's what my fiance all day gets to do <laughs> about ai i wouldn't even say she's outside the field at this point because i've talked to her about it so much she's like legit knowledgeable like i was working on uh audio data augmentation and she suggested a method and it was something that Google I don't remember what the method was but she was like why don't you try doing this and it reminded me that Google had written a paper about it like 2 years ago the same augmentation and so like, she's getting good <laughs> <laughs> how do you keep finding these ideas so you know that you want to work on audio and you've already shared your reason audience check out that interview if you haven't but how do you know what what ideas to pick next already when you know what you're working about and you might be already running out of ideas there's no running out of ideas i feel it's just a hierarchy it's like i feel like there's so much out there uh i just generate more ideas than i'm able to keep up with and i'm sure you feel the same choosing which one is yeah a good question i just look at the couple top most promising and see One really good thing I learned a couple years ago is someone suggested choose projects where even if you fail, even when if they're not successful, you'll still win. And what that means is say you're starting a business. Um if you start a business and the business fails and you don't make any money, will you still have gained a bunch of stuff and either experience or skills, knowledge, contacts. So I try and use that as a metric uh to look at if I I'm looking at a bunch of projects that might not succeed. I try and choose the ones that even if I fail I'm going to come away winning. Um that's a good input. But yeah, really just following your passion, like trying to build cool stuff. That's what keeps me the most motivated, the most interested. So I've been working on uh fast AI audio, been working on some tutorials for Jupiter. Uh I think there's a lot of really really cool stuff that cuz Jupiter was built like a long time ago and all our generation of data scientists are totally new. uh not all but you know there's a lot of people coming into the field and i feel like there's so many things in jupiter that were built in that everyone's just forgotten about there's like some amazing functionality so i'm working on some stuff related to that that i'll release soon 
Uh, I've been doing a lot of JavaScript, uh, working to develop mobile apps eventually. I like the idea of having, uh, being able to take that idea, these crazy ideas I get, and have the entire stack of uh, Python through machine learning, through JavaScript to deployment on either web app or mobile. So I really like the idea of, uh, so I'm, you know, practicing learning there, but it's just, it's almost too much to keep up with. Um, but that's a good thing. Like you said, everyone we've talked to who is pretty successful wakes up wanting to do this stuff. So. Yeah. Uh, do, do you find yourself heading off into tangents? Because that's, that's one thing that I even struggle with now. So you find something very interesting, you head off into a tangent. How do you backtrace yourself to, to the original idea? Yeah, it's almost like uh, I get distracted from my distractions sometimes. So I'll be working on my main project. I'll be like, okay, I'm going to do just this this week. And then something kind of urgent comes up and I'll get <laughs> off on that. And I have to, it's almost like a stack trace. You have to go back down the pile, back down to the bottom thing you were originally working on. Uh, I think that's personally probably a, a weakness of mine uh, is I do tend to get a little bit off track there. Like I said, I think the reflection weekly helps because, you know, then I'm really forced to look at, is this the best use of my time? Does this have to happen now? Um, and sometimes the answer is yes, and that's okay. And you can, you can get off on side things. Um, but I'm pretty good. One thing that really, really helps, and I encourage everybody to do, if you do find yourself doing that, is keep a list and a document, some type of structure somewhere where you can put those ideas so that you know you're not going to lose them. You can get them out of your head. But I have, uh, I use a software called Workflowy, but it's really just like a nested list. You can, okay. pretty much any list software. And I keep a lot of stuff there. I keep my ideas for potential projects, my ideas for things to write about my ideas for things I would like to teach or that I feel I could put into a tutorial, uh, the million things I have to learn, uh, all the different things, you know, pandas, PyTorch, getting better at those things, certain tutorials, I put everything there and it's okay if it's in my kind of future pile. And if I, when I go needing things to look for or needing things to do, I go check it out and say, what, what goes to the front of the line. But I think one reason we get so attached to stuff and get distracted is because we feel like if we don't do it now, we won't ever do it. Uh, so I think having kind of a safe place, a system where you know you won't lose that thing will help you let go of it and say, yeah, if it's really important, then it'll be there in a month. For sure. And again, if something is trending in that week, it, it, it'll be tempting to go out and check, check it out as soon as it comes out. And the ML community, the community of nerds that we are a part of, Twitter amplifies that by the number of likes, the number of retweets, and then you're really curious to check that thing out. And if, if it's curiosity driven, you wouldn't realize how much time you've already spent on it. Yeah. And I think that's a good thing. I think it's cool to get into like the latest stuff and play around with it. But I personally don't do that really myself. Um, maybe some in the audio space, but I think it might be good for and maybe you'll disagree here, but it might be good for beginners and even intermediate people to avoid that kind of as a habit because things just pop up on the radar. Like yeah. what was it, efficient net? Everyone was talking about how great it is and now everyone's talking about how it doesn't actually do what it's promised because, uh, but anyway, you can just, every week there's gonna be a new thing and you could jump into it. But I think that's something you can wait for till you're you know, doing machine learning research and you're kind of at the cutting edge uh, and for now, focus on fundamental stuff, things you need to learn. And the brilliant thing about it is, you know, you're not going to miss anything because Jeremy's going to go make a new fast AI every year and he's going to take the best of everything. Like he's going to put it in there and teach you about it. So you're not going to miss it. And I think it is important to be on the cutting edge and do research when you're at that point. Uh, but I think you don't need to try the 50 new hot things that are coming out because only five of them are going to be around in five years. And Jeremy's going to find them for you. So you can just kind of sit back and focus on other stuff. It's more with, important. With a very high BS filter and with a very high aspect of knowing what things work would be there in the course, things that have been battle tested thoroughly. Yeah, absolutely. Like, and you know, if they haven't been, he'll go, he and Sylvan will do the research themselves and will just try every hyperparameter combination, make sure it works on different data sets. It's resilient. It combines well with other things. So yeah, that's a really huge benefit to the community and takes um, 
that weight off your shoulders if you feel like you're missing like I know I still feel that way. Like I see like all these things going on with like the recent optimization functions and Mish and Ranger going around the forums. I'm, that looks so cool. I want to jump in. Like, why am I not doing that? But the reality is with the current state of the art from 2019, last year's stuff, you can still get really cool, really great yeah. results. So just focus on building something cool. And then if you want later, you can get that extra half percent accuracy by adding in a new optimization function. I think it again goes back to the goal setting scenario where you really need to know what you want out of the course, even for beginners. And I, I think I agree with you that if you keep jumping back and forth, for example, if you've signed up for the fast A course and fast A doesn't cover right now attention, at least in the deep learning course, and you discover that attention based models are trending, that might not be the best use of your time unless and until you already know the background details or the foundations that you absolutely need to before you can put those into good use. So that that could also be a good investment of your time, depending again, if your goals demand that. Yeah, a hundred percent. And that's, that's the technique I use when I'm lost and I'm not sure what to learn next. I go try and build the thing that's in my head and I see where I get stuck. And so if you go and you're building something, uh, and you realize, oh, I don't know how to do this, or my optimization, this is unlikely, but my optimization function is just not cutting it, then go do that thing. But like, try and do what you set out to do. You didn't set out to learn the absolute best optimization function in the world. That's not why everyone came to machine learning. We all came here to make applications and to build stuff that's cool and put it out in the world. So try and do that and then learn what you have to do uh, to do it. And yeah, I think there's like a really interesting divide there between uh, two types of skills. The ones that are like the ones for programming that you need for building the stuff. Um, so and we talked about this a little bit at the beginning of the podcast. So, uh, you know, learning PyTorch and how to use it or learning a specific technique, the very specific parts. And then there's the more general stuff we talked about, like... Um, becoming a better coder, having better practices, having good file hygiene, so not having everything dumped in one folder together, uh, that are kind of more of the, they pay dividends every day and they're good for the long term. Uh, so how do you go about trying to decide, we talked a little earlier, but how to work in the those kind of skills that are um, not immediately useful, but again, uh, useful over time. I think, I think it again falls back to the goal setting. And so I, I'm in a weird situation where I have been educated at a one-on-one -on -one level doing the podcast. So I understand what I need to know and what would be helpful. So my advice would be, please go ahead and check out all of the interviews that I've done to have that insight. And I'm not sure if, if uh, you, that might be worth your time. So I, I have a good sense of knowledge of how to navigate something and things that have really worked for other people. So that adds in, adds a huge weight to the idea of maybe learning all of the Git uh, strategies would be helpful. And yes, of course, that would be helpful. So I decided to invest time there. Maybe investing time into a Kaggle competition, building a single model and not just trying to accuracy would be helpful. So maybe I should try and do that, which I haven't yet, but I know for a fact that it will help me. So just knowing these things uh, and looking out for what has worked really well for other people. And that's, that's a goal with the podcast also to be able to broadcast all of these ideas, but uh, what has worked for other people at scale is supposed to help you also, unless you absolutely have that gut feeling that this thing is going to do it better for you, then go ahead and do it. And, you might create a dual defy. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. I would also recommend people to go back and listen to the podcast, read the blogs, just there's so many little pieces of wisdom that there's just no other way to pick up um, tips. People give as kind of throwaways that <laughs> you'll look back on two years later and realize like how much they change stuff for you. Uh, like one was uh, we've talked about Radic and the, podcast so far but he just said never do anything that takes more than 
I think 15 or 30 seconds. Yeah. Uh, so like if you're training your model, train it on tiny little chunks so that you don't have to sit there for three minutes, you'll get distracted. And I didn't realize how important that was, especially when I have limited time because I'm doing the whole deep work thing. So I can't afford to get distracted. Um, and yeah, that was something I just read offhand. And another one was he showed that, uh, Jupiter has a debugger. Uh, he did that in one of his tweets and that just saved me hours of going back and putting print statements, I decided that's an example of kind of a skill that pays dividends over time. It's learning how to use a debugger in the proper way. Uh, something I put off for a really long time thinking it would be harder than it is. Yeah. Um, those types of things, getting a little bit better at like Linux command line, just the things that you have to do on a daily basis to do the really important things, the model building, the application building, those things. Because if you're trying to do um, you know, you're always going to be kind of at your cutting edge and with the, uh, model building, you're always going to be doing something that's pretty hard for you. Um, so just having the ability to be solid in those other areas and not have to worry about them. Uh, I find that's the hardest thing probably as a beginner is you have four or five different areas where you're weak and they just overlap in certain ways that it's just really difficult yeah. uh, to overcome when you're trying to you know, try something new in Python and you go to the Linux command line to install the library and you get some error you've never seen. And just going down that chain is, it's really hard. You just feel you run from one bug to the next. And for, for the record, I don't absolutely recommend my content. I unfortunately don't have any other way figured out yet how to get those throwaway wisdoms out there. Like you did with uh, things Jeremy says to do, which again is an awesome thread that, I think we will also try to convert into a podcast, but I think you need to figure out ways of how to gather wisdom from the really smart people, either through reading all of their comments on a forum or just closely observing on about how they function. If for example, you're in a Kaggle competition, similar to another person, and then you really get to observe on how they are progressing, or you might get to team up with them and understand how they function and take that wisdom away. I don't think there's, there's any other substitute for that. Yeah. I think that's one of the most important meta skills you can have is just learning to take things from other people and see this person does this, or this person did this thing I want to replicate. How did they do it? And then trying to look into stuff they've written and see how you could adjust your behavior to follow their path more closely since they were so successful. I mean, we've got a lot of examples of people who have done really amazing things in the community. So, you know, take your pick. And again, going, going back to the question, no one does it because they just want to help the community. It's part of the process and things really fit nicely into the picture for them. But I think generally speaking for anyone in the data science world, they enjoy helping newbies also in any capacity that they like, be it direct tutorials, be it writing blog posts, kernels, discussions in and, and beyond that also. Yeah, it's super fulfilling. Like I've, again, not done much writing, but the few pieces I have done, I wrote an uh, intro to audio tutorial and I'll occasionally get someone to reach out and say it was helpful. And that, you know, makes my day when people do it. So I think, um, yeah, it's really nice to just help out and feel like you're adding value. I think that's that's also another interesting aspect and I, I'd be curious to know how would you discover things that you want to write about? Do you, do you look for gaps or uh, do you follow the trend and see where the gaps are in that trend or do you just follow your curiosity and, and think of writing it down? Yeah, I I usually try to write about something I've recently learned but I don't feel like there was a good resource for, so I try and invent it. And audio is a perfect example of that. Um, I started out learning audio from scratch. I didn't know anything, didn't know what sample rates or spectrograms were or how audio worked. Um, and I cobbled together my self-education from you know, 20 or 30 different resources. I'd read an article here about this one thing and then another article from here. And there was no just introduction to audio for people who wanted to build machine learning audio applications. And so I tried to take kind of the best bits and pieces of knowledge and structure them. And 
um, actually it's something I'm really looking forward to refactoring. Uh, I feel like it was a good guide, but I read a great piece. I, we can post it in the show notes that was passed on to me uh, by some of the people in our audio thread. And it's about how to do technical writing uh, and the four different purposes, whether it's documentation, a tutorial, a how-to guide, or there's another one. Um, but we can post that. And it was really enlightening to see how looking at it from this perspective of four different categories and what the goals are. Uh, and I realized that a lot of writing out there, mine included, is mixing multiple purposes and is leading it to being less effective than it could be if you stuck to one. Um, another thing I'd encourage people to do that I didn't do in the past that I've kind of realized lately is um, I, it's really tempting to write you know, when you learn something new and you really understand it, it's really exciting to write about the why and, uh, you know, why this works and all that. But sometimes you're going to be meeting users who just want to know how they just yeah. want the code. They just want the line. And that's okay. They might have a deadline tomorrow. So I found a lot of documentation out there where the how is buried in the why. Uh, a perfect example is Jupyter extensions. Um, so, most people I know don't use extensions for Jupyter, even though they're uh, really, really essential. They just do so much uh, to make notebooks more usable, more readable. And I personally procrastinated on it for a year. It was on my list in that file, things to do, learn how to use Jupyter extensions. And it's, it's a really basic thing, but there's three lines you need to install and they're spaced throughout the documentation. There's like two lines here. And then there's another line that's, you know, <laughs> two thirds of the way down the page before they tell you that line, they explain an alternative way to do it. That takes about two paragraphs. And then they explain that that's actually the worst way to do it. And they say, we suggest you do it this way. And so between all that, they've buried the how in the why and made it so that no one's using it. You should give the how up front, whether it's a too long, didn't read, here's the code, here's what I'm trying to say, and just offer that value to the people who want it. And then the people who want the why will stick around for it. The people who need to understand, but not everyone needs to understand. I've realized that. And now I see it everywhere when I'm reading. Uh, there's so many resources that just don't tell you what you need to know because they're caught up in the writing and the act of it, um, which is fine, but it would be just great to have that summary up the top. Uh, if you're having a day where you just need to get things done, here you go. This is what you need to know. If you want to read on and you really need a deeper understanding, here's that too. It's it's actually very interesting because you can never know. And the only way to assess this because you don't always get a lot of comments unless you made a blunder or a mistake in, in it, you will continue growing the audience. The views will keep going up and to a person who's broadcasting that might be a positive sign because there'll be also people who are just looking for the why that like you mentioned, and there'll also be people that are just looking for the how. It's, it's difficult to distinguish. So there are two aspects of how should you deliver information and how should you digest information? That's again, an iterative process. And the problem with broadcasting or just writing tutorials is you'll struggle with feedback a lot. And secondly, because you, you're already struggling with the feedback, a single feedback could completely derail you because that's the only feedback that you have, or that's the only comment that you have. So you need to figure out how to digest the feedback, how to digest the content or how to deliver it also. Yeah, definitely. I think maybe the one way, because yeah, you're right. There really is a lack of feedback out there on writing and on technical writing. Um, maybe just trying to be more aware when reading and trying to learn something yourself of what your purpose is when you're reading it. Am I just trying to get something done? Am I trying to understand a concept? and then seeing what helps and what doesn't and how, um, cause it's a lot easier when you take the perspective of the reader, yeah. uh, which we're all out there. I know reading tons of things on medium and reading about the latest tech. So I think it's easy to kind of put those shoes on and uh, see how can I be a better writer by focusing on what's hard for you when you're a reader. Um, Definitely. One other thing is how do you go about you know, there's people of all different skill levels throughout the community and you want to reach all of them. Uh, you want to reach, you know, the Kaggle Grand Masters as well as the person who's fast AI day one. So how do you structure your writing to have the kind of maximum readability to reach the beginners, but without boring the experts? 
I don't think I, I do a good job at it, but I'm being upfront about what I'm trying to de- deliver, for example, uh, and I found this really good example and I am sure it wouldn't work for everything. But one of my best Kaggle kernels, the one that has a gold medal on it, is about fast AI image augmentations. Mm-hmm. The way I structured it is uh, delivering you some information through analogies. And like you said, I first talk about the how, okay, this is this augmentation and picking one single example so just so that I can show you how does it compare across every single augmentation so you really know, okay, this is what's going on and why is covered in, okay, for example, if you want to do vertical flips, that might be useful in a summer day pool detection situation where that's where you could do. And then having the code indexed inside of there. And this is a trend that's really coming up on Kaggle kernels also. So if a business person is looking at a really good kernel, good in double quotes, but the code would already be hidden and there'll be a really nice story around it because again, data science is meant for people who are from the business world. That's why there's so much money pouring into it. So you need to be good at sending out the information. And for someone who's trying to build on top of it, you also need to have the code in there. So the way I structured that particular one example was I had the complete code and also the story in the kernel. And in the blog post, I just had the story with very minimal code and pointers to the kernel constantly. So, okay, if you want to check out the technical details, so to speak, go to the kernel. That's a really nice way of structuring it. Yeah. Uh, It's almost like having two separate pieces so that you can kind of reach both sides, but also offering it to anyone who wants to consume both. So. And this, this was one good example where it really worked. And I, I, I can understand that it wouldn't work for a wide variety of situations. But uh, if if that works for you, that's a really good way. And that's why many, many blog posts leave the GitHub link right at the top. So if you're the kind of person that likes to download the notebook and run the experiment for themselves, and I know many people do that, even with research papers, go ahead and do that by all means. You absolutely don't need to read the blog post, or if you need some context, go ahead and read it. Yeah. Um, one other thing I had thought about, I've seen so much. Have you played around with uh, NB Dev, the new notebook? I haven't. From? Not yet. There's a lot of cool stuff going on, but it just opens up so many doors. Um, so you could almost, um, to explain to the users, uh, inside of the Jupyter cells, you can put uh, little hashtags that will cause different functionality. So if you put hashtag export inside of a cell, the code from that cell will be exported to a Python file. So it can be treated like a normal uh, library or module, but it just opens the door to so many different things, uh, like the ability to have uh, in a blog style post, uh, the cells coded by uh, difficulty level. So you can have a more in-depth explanation that goes and is only shown to beginners or something that's, and the beginners can choose to hide the stuff that like really gets in the weeds. And then everyone can be looking at a different document or a different tutorial kind of dynamically. Um, So that idea just randomly popped in my head. Sorry to (laughs) toss it out. I think it it really works for the fast A course also, right? Where Jeremy shows that us where if you shift tab once you get some information if you shift tab twice you get the documentation and then if if you're really crazy you can go ahead and look at the source code also so depending on what your requirement of the r what's the need of your r follow any level of depth th- that you want yeah i would love to see something like that applied to blogs in the general the ability to like shift tab like show me more shift tab show me more so maybe in the future, they're doing a lot of cool, really experimental stuff. So yeah, we'll see. Anything else you want to talk about today? I got one more thing I wanted to get in there, but I'll see. I've, what you've got. I've, I've heard already. Uh, I know this part of the video doesn't appear for the audience, but I, I, I think you might have noticed this is my 11th cup of chai. <laughs> I, no. I think where are they coming from? I have a jar right, a jug right next to me which I filled up because I, I knew this was going to be an interesting conversation. Yeah. I, 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 I pretty much asked all of my questions that I had for you. Um, 
So one more I had, or one idea I wanted to bring out is, do you ever use uh, any type of like flashcard or memorization tools? Or have you heard of Anki? I have, I, I tried to use them, but again, that's an explicit habit that doesn't come into my procrastination schedule. <laughs> so what I try to do is keep notes, keep notes in different formats. And I've even gone out to the extent of buying apps on iPad, which no one likes to very honestly speaking, even if they might be for a dollar or two, just because I have a Apple pencil, not being an endorser of any products, but because I assumed writing the notes there would have been helpful. And then again, I just keep defaulting to the situation where I just try to remember it because and I don't think I have a good memory, but just remembering the little details and this has worked well for me, even in general context where if I just try to remember the things that are important, I definitely forget the ones that are not important. And I, that does cause a lot of mess ups here and there, but I just use a mental retainer of everything. So that automatically filters out what's not necessary for me, which I don't recommend. Do you come back to the notes and like just review them every? I do. Okay. I do. Because uh, for example, and other people already take care of this. So if you enjoy someone's notes already so much, for example, I really like Hiromi's notes for fast AI. I absolutely know that I don't need to create a replica of this. This is the best thing that I could ask for. There's no shame in me using that already. Something that someone has created. Oh yeah, absolutely. Those notes are just incredible resource for anyone. Hopefully uh, we'll have something similar for the next round of fast AI. The, the same question for you. Do you find any other things interesting in this aspect? Yeah, I use Anki like fairly religiously, I'd say. Um, and it's, it's something actually, I've heard Jeremy talk about it a decent amount because he uses it for language, uh, but says don't use it for coding. Uh, yeah. And I would say I, I disagree. I've been using it for coding and love it. Not for memorizing code, but I think there's just so much out there. We're learning from so many different areas. Um, I initially kind of early on would have the trouble of, you know, I would go do something in one area of coding. Like I would build a website using Django, it's Python web framework. And I would go do my normal machine learning stuff. And I'd come back four months later and I built this big application, like actually working in the real world. And I wouldn't even know like how to start it back up. I wouldn't know the basics. So I was like, because I was hopping between so many things, I felt like I was really just spinning my wheels and not, uh, not remembering any of it. I was just spending all this time repeat learning. Um, so what I ended up doing was starting to try out and play with Anki for, so for those who don't know, Anki is a space memory repetition system. It's like a flashcard system. But since it's a computer, it remembers every time you've ever seen a given flashcard and how many times you've gotten it right and wrong. And from that, it calculates uh, the optimal time to show it to you again. Uh, and that way, you spend more time focusing on the things you have trouble with and the things you find easy. You know, you won't see it again for a year. Uh, so it's really nice. It just handles the scheduling for you. It handles the studying. Each day, you just sit down for five, ten minutes and do a set of flashcards. You have to do the discipline part. Um, but that's one area where I disagree with Jeremy. He said that he hadn't found it useful for coding. I think, um, I think the factor of having the proficiency and experience also counts in there. So I assume like I can, I can speak for the both of us. I think uh, we're really new to the field and he's been doing it for all of these years at a very good level at a very perfect level so maybe it's not for him but i i think it, it I, I can see it being useful for us yeah that was exactly my reasoning when i heard him say it. i said well it's because you're the master you know he can switch <laughs> between these new technologies so quickly and he does don't get me wrong he has uh a really good reason he says that if you use a certain technology like you know you're in there using jupiter vs code and you just use it you will remember the stuff uh, which is true, but you know, when you're being constantly introduced to all these new concepts across all these different subdomains, I found it really useful because what I found happening the time around when I realized it is when I was in fast AI and I was trying to learn kind of new concepts. And I realized that the underlying concepts that I, that those things were based on and building off of, uh, I was shaky on. So I would be trying to understand for 
just to throw a random example out there, Prelude, which is uh, where you put the activation function inside of a res block before the skip connection, before the identity connection. If that makes no sense, don't worry about it. But you can see it relies on a lot of different terms. And if you're not totally sure about every single one of those, it's really hard to get to that next level concept. So what I found was that uh, a lot of the time I was stuck, it wasn't because the new concept was hard, but it was because I didn't have a concise internalized representation of the stuff it was built on top of. So I felt that going back and saying, uh, just you know, making cards for how to do things, both coding and conceptual, um, was really really helpful. I feel like a superpower for me, um, and I feel like I don't have to go back and take courses multiple times or as many times. You know, I still take end up taking Fast AI Part One three times uh, because it's you know so dense and there's so much there. You can really get information from it as you go back over it. Yeah, but I found that it's really lowered my, it's increased my retention and lowered my uh, need to go back and retake courses and things like JavaScript, um, just to know basic things that they throw out in a class about how a language works, um, but that you'll likely just forget in a week or two. I think there's also another factor of how well established are you in your framework and how I like, like to think of it is if you're getting frustrated is because you have this gap of your goals and where you currently at. And if you're not hitting your goals, that because that's because you already know you can do better. That's the, depending again, you might not be in the same situation. It's the case for me. If, if I'm getting frustrated is because I'm not hitting my goals, even though I know I can maybe Anki might help. So just having that reflection and I think you already do it every, every week, but really understanding how you work in your framework that you constantly have to reevaluate and then using Anki or notes or different formats could, could be useful. Yeah, absolutely. It's definitely not for everyone, but it's one of the tools to kind of consider. I think it's important that people find what works for them like you found notes but just having something there being able to identify problems like my problem was you know i just did this thing three months ago how is it that i've already forgotten it and my solution was anki for someone who has a more consistent memory that might not be necessary uh, but just that's you've hit exactly the key point is to identify your problems fix them things get a little easier each week just do that and uh, you'll be a grandmaster in no time. Awesome. Should should we end on that note, or uh, yeah. do you have any other ideas? Because I've already run out of chai and ideas. <laughs> yeah, we're out the of same chai time and ideas. Uh, <laughs> I think that was good. I, I think we touched on a ton of stuff. Um, I had a great time. Likewise, I, I hope the audience will excuse me if, if they're not here for my views, but thank you for keeping the conversation going and uh, thank you for saying yes to this crazy, crazy idea. Yeah, likewise. Thanks for inviting me on. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed the show, please be sure to give it a review or feel free to shoot me a message. You can find all of the social media links in the description. If you like the show, please subscribe and tune in each week to Chai Time Data Science.